gentlemen, and I hope you're enjoying our lunch buffet. Our keynote speaker will be starting in a few minutes, but we have a few things to share with you before he takes the stage. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, for this dinner's program, we will be in the same area, C, D, and E, although the agenda you have at your table may say something slightly different. Just know for dinner, you can be back in the same location that you are for lunch. And if you have any uh, fellow Toastmasters that have yet to register, registration has been moved into the foyer and will be closing at 4.30. Assuming everyone in this room doesn't have that problem, but if anyone calls you on their way to the conference, you can let them know. And now, actually, for her first public appearance today, we have a couple of things that our conference chair is kind of amazing at pulling this together to share with you. So please welcome our conference chair, Michaela Hall. Thank you, Patrick. All right, passed out to some of your tables, bingo cards, and to those tables that do not have it yet, I will pass it out soon. We did this at the fall conference, so you were there, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great way to network with other people that you haven't met before. And it's a great way to just stand up and move your legs and meet some new people. So, for the big bell. For those of you that can't see it, I promise it'll make sense once you do. There's different squares, for example. Someone that's a, or was a current candidate. Someone that has three or more kids. Someone that's a DTM. Someone that's the club president. So you have to find someone that relates to each of those squares, have them sign in the box, and it has to be a different person for each box. Once you fill it out completely, you can go to the registration table and get an extra raffle card, or extra raffle ticket. So again, fill it out completely with different names for each square, and you'll get an extra raffle card. Thank you so much, I hope you're enjoying lunch. And we'll have a, continue to have a great show. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Patrick. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I love the energy. It makes me feel alive. A couple of things I wanted to share with you. Number one, I hope you're all enjoying the food. Yes? Yes. A little unique, a little flavorful. This is fantastic. I wanted to share with you a couple of things so that you are aware of the upcoming events as well as some of the um, options that we have available during this conference. Number one, I've been approached and many of my quartet members have been approached about hey, where can I buy some old books and paraphernalia, some books, manuals. Well, we do have a resource room, aka bookstore, a little hidden gem just like Toastmasters in general. If you are looking to buy manual Toastmasters gear, what we will share with you is that the resource room is right next to where the registration rooms were. So if you go by the swimming pools in the back, and in a little enclosed room, there's a glass door, that is where the resource room is. I do encourage you to stop by. Kathy, are you here? Kathy Stroh? The store. She's already, look at how committed she is. Unbelievable, that is fantastic. So Kathy Stroh is waiting to see you. She said, Nick Paul, I'm super lonely and I need to want to see some of my district 30 members. I said, I swear, I will send people over to you. So, please stop by, if there's nothing else, say hi to Kathy and pick up something while you're there. Second thing I want to share with you, for if you are an area director or a division director currently, that means you are serving in your term, I wanted to share with you that there has been a change to our deck calendar. That is, that normally we meet on the second Saturday of the month in May. That is being changed to the first Saturday of the month. That is going to be Saturday, May 6th. That is out of honor for those of us that will be celebrating Mother's Day weekend with our mothers. We wanted to make sure that we do what we do best, and that is take care of our loved ones. 
So that is for area directors and division directors that are currently serving in that role today, moving the decade back. Also want to share with you about the upcoming June 3rd TLI. Now this is an opportunity where at least at the club officer level, you know that you should be starting to hold your club officer election. Preferably the first meeting of May. Now if you don't have your slate of candidates within your club, there's still time. Get that going and then conduct and hold your elections. You can then update your club officer list on the Toastmasters.org website. And then you can let them know about the training that will be taking place on uh, Saturday, June 3rd. That will be held at the Holiday Inn Countryside. And there are a couple of reasons why I would love to see as many club officers and members there. Number one, that is the first opportunity to get training completed. Some of you are like, yes, I go to training every six months, so this is nothing new. Yes, but to start the year off, we want to make sure that you have the tools, the education, and the information you need to do a great job. So number one, training. Number two, if, you, if your club is celebrating an anniversary, for example, this year we celebrated our one year anniversary, five year anniversary, ten year anniversary, at the TLI, the district will be awarding those clubs that are celebrating a 1, 5, 10, 15 year anniversary with a club ribbon. So make sure you are there for that. And of course, our club growth directors had an incentive that they ran very recently called Make It Great. Make It Great for 8 by 20 years. My PQD elect is already telling me what to do. So. If you are one of the 36 clubs that won that incentive, we will ensure that at that event, you will receive your prize. And Tiffany, if you can remind me again, what did those 36 clubs win? A slide advancer for your presentation. A slide advancer for presentations, fantastic. Um, the last thing I have is, that's actually it, I might have COVID. Nope, I apologize. International speech, as you know, will be held this afternoon starting at 4.30 sharp. And it will be held in this room, that room, and the one behind it. So salons C, B, and E. If you are an international speech contestant, the briefings will be taking place starting at 4 o'clock sharp. Tentatively, at this point, it is slated to be taking place at the boardroom. And if you walk towards the resource room that I mentioned earlier, you will find the boardroom and you will see me standing there as well. So I will make sure I find you and we will have that spot. So again, international speech contestants, if you're in this room, 4 o'clock sharp, briefings are going to take place. We will meet you by the boardroom or in that general atrium-like area. If you are an inter a functionary, a functionary serving a role during the International Speech Contest, your briefing is going to take place starting at 4 o'clock sharp in patio A and B. Patio A and B. It is critical that we as Toastmasters show integrity at the end time. That is why I make this announcement, just to make sure that everything runs like up. That is all that I have for you. Again, I appreciate your attention, and I would like to turn the microphone over back to our MC for the afternoon, Mr. Patrick Stinson. Well, now on to our, our keynote speaker. Fellow Toastmasters, welcome to our lunch program. I want to point out that all of us came here for a reason. Most likely when you joined, it was to refine your public speaking skills. Or, it could have been to overcome that fear of public speaking that is constantly at the top of every list of fears. But eventually, you probably realized that there's a large organization out there. One that's focused on the member and the member's individual growth. Magnus Jansen, distinguished Toastmaster, is our reigning international director for Region 5. And if you're not familiar with Region 5, our District 30 is one of the eight districts in Region 5, stretching from Wisconsin to the north, 
all the way down to Mississippi in the south, parts of Virginia in the east, and west to Missouri. As of March of this year, the region has approximately 15,000 paid members in close to 1,100 clubs. Now, when Magnus is not wearing his Toastmasters cape as an international director, when he's not the Super Toastmaster, he dons his secret identity, yes. working for multinational food companies in the food industry. He's done that for more than 28 years. Magnus has worked in countries such as Sweden, Germany, Italy, and Russia before moving to the United States in the fall of 1998. And when I chat with Magnus, I think I can tell a touch of each of those countries in his accent. <laughs> Magnus's current position is project manager, managing multiple projects with multi-million dollar budgets. And as a global leader, he has learned and applied his leadership skills applicable to a multicultural <laughs> workforce. The speech we're about to hear will focus on the strategic direction of the organization, the core values, and how all of this applies to us. Distinguished Toastmaster, Magnus Jensen. location here. You can all see me, you can all hear me. Excellent. If you can't, well, please rise, stand up, and be happy. <laughs> now, there is a huge benefit of serving on the board of directors for this fantastic organization, and that is go to districts, visit districts. The other benefit when you go and visit districts is they want you to do a keynote, and they give you a package this thick of talking points. Hmm? Because the intent is I will give you an organizational update. Talk about uh, the vision, the future of the organization and so on, so let's do that. Our ambitious future tells us we want to be the first choice provider of dynamic, high value, experiential communication and leadership skills development. You've all heard that, right? Yes. 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 The district mission is to build clubs and support all clubs in achieving excellence. Yes. You that? Yes. The organization stands at an all-time high in membership in club because of strong leadership, exceptional product, and disciplined planning. To ensure that we continue our focus on the organization's core ideology, represented through the mission and core values and the future we envision, we must make decisions and take actions that shape and guide. But you don't want to hear this, do you? No. 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 That's really not why you came here, was it? No. You want to hear something else, right? Yes. So, let me let you in on a little secret. Four out of six times when I've done this speech, there has been a world champion of public speaking up in the audience. No pressure, right? <laughs> do you have anyone here like that? Okay, good. But I do have an evaluator. That might be a little bit worse. <laughs> no, what I really want to do, I want to say, well, what I've learned from world champions is that you should position yourself in certain locations and now you associate things with my location. So at this point in time, you associate me standing here with organizational announcements, right? Right. Yes. yes. Did I hear you? Yes. Yes. So I shouldn't be here when I do the rest of the speech, right? Correct. Right, so I'll move up here. Okay. Now, through Toastmasters, you learn a lot of things, and you also learn that you can take inspiration from other parts of the world. And I live, I've lived in Indianapolis for about 19 years. And during those 19 years, I realized one thing, only one thing. <laughs> and that is that Indianapolis is really the racing capital of the world. Yeah. Yay! Any Hoosiers in here, Don? No. Never mind. <laughs> from that standpoint, I, I've also got fascinated by saying that you can learn something from racing and you can apply it to what we do. Uh huh. Let's, uh, let's go down that path. Because what I learned last year, anyone went to the Indy 500 race last year? Uh, no. no? It's only a three hour drive for you? <laughs> it's not that bad. The, the race takes three hours as well, so. <laughs> but what I learned was, you 
don't necessarily need to have the fastest car to win. And I will get to that a little bit, because I was there. I was sitting at turn three. So I bring you into turn three of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which is an oval. It's a four-mile oval. And turn three is right here. I could have a view right out, out to something called the snake pit. You don't want to be there unless you're 15 years old or 20 and you're in the party mode. I can see down the back straight. I can see turn two over there. Can you see it? Can you see turn two over there? Turn three is right here. And turn four is over there somewhere. Now, hey, turn four. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> and then you have the front going down on turn one over there. And I can't see that because there are stands and pagoda in the way. So. So you get the vision of what the racetrack looks like, right? So the turn two, you go straight, you go turn three, you go fast as you can, turn four, that's where the question's at. Actually, I'm also in turn one. We'll get to that. It was a very exciting race. You get into lap 197. Right now I'm at lap 197. I'm standing up, I'm cheering. There are 300,000, 350,000 people in the stands, and the snake pit is jumping up and down, and they are having a party, and I don't know that there's a race going on. <laughs> but we were looking at the race. And those of you who have been to a race before, in an oval race, would say, well, we have no clue who is first or second, because they just go by, go by. Last year, they did something new. They did something new. They basically had a display behind the head of each driver that said what position that drive, that car was in. It was exciting because we could see coming down from the straight, we could see car number, the car number 21, that was James Hinchcliffe. Car number 10, that was Tony Canal. That was car number 5, that was, uh, did I say Hinchcliffe before? It's actually New Garden in number 5 because New, no, it's the other way around. It's, Beside the point. <laughs> 26, Carlos Munoz, and they had been going at it for a couple of laps, and you get into lap 197, did I mention there are 200 laps? It's the race for the finish. This is the time when things will really happen. What an excitement, and I will tell you more about that excitement a little later in the, in the uh, speech. <laughs> because I want to teach you some lessons. I want to tell you something about racing that applies at that particular point in time. And that is, when you are a race car driver, you sit in that car. And what is your goal? Your goal is to finish the race. Hmm? Some would argue, yes, I really want to win the race. And ultimately, that's what we want. But we want to finish the race. So when you get into that car, you all Consider yourself race car drivers at this point in time. You get, get into that little cramped cockpit and it's time to do something. Hmm? It's time to do something. So what's the first thing that happens? Well, on the racetrack, there is a lot of communication going on. Communication between the track and the race car driver. Between the pit crew and the race car driver. And how do we communicate? Well, with radio, you say, but that's not my speech, because that wouldn't be a good speech. We are communicating by visual aids. How many race fans in here? Okay, there's three, four, five. Actually, I did this speech, I did this speech in Indianapolis last week, and I got three fans. I don't know why. So you're much better. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, I did the speech in Decatur, Illinois, and I got four fans there too, and, and that's a different story. Anyway, back to the communication. So when you begin the race, you will see a flag, right? You will see a green flag. Everyone can see that this is a green flag? Yes. yes. Good, good. Because I want to make sure that we really see this green flag. What does green flag mean in racing? Go! Go! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines! Time to go! Now, there are three ways in racing in general that you can start a race. And this is also important, keep in mind. Indian 500, the NASCAR, 
they do something that is called a rolling start. That basically means that you go around the track a couple of laps, get information, warm up the tires, because warm tires are very important. Cold tires, you go into the wall and you don't want to be there. Once you get the formation laps going and you get to the start-finish line, you, they wave the green flag and off you go and the race starts. Everyone crashes in turn one. <laughs> no, that's a different race. Formula One has a different type of start. Instead of the rolling starts, they have a standing start. And what does a standing start mean? That means that you have one lap, drive around, warm up your tires, you can, those of you who have watched Formula One, you can see that the first lap, they just go back and forth. It looks like they actually came out of the bar just recently. And you wonder, well, why are you going on a race? Then they stop and they wait for the green light and off they go. The race starts. That's a standing start. Now, there's a third kind of start in racing. It's called the Le Mans start. Right? So they are out driving, warming up the car, and then they park the car over there, so you can imagine plenty of cars over there. Mm -hmm. Then all the race car drivers, they're over here, on that side. Mm -hmm. Hands in the pocket, because that's where they have the key. The cars, they're idle. They're not, they're not going at all. Race car drivers over here. Someone stands in the middle. I don't know why they stand in the middle, because as you wave the green flag there, there's a stampede of, of all the race car drivers. They're running all, all the way over there looking for the keys, jumping in the car, trying to get... No, oh, I don't think they have keys. But they start the car and off they go. Mm -hmm. The Le Mans start. Now, if you look at those three ways of starting, because my speech is really about toastmasters, it's not about racing. So now, put, put yourself into the... Uh, mindset of being an officer in an organization, any kind of officer. Let's take um, district director electors, for example. Okay? Now, when you get to that point in time, at any given time, you have to ask yourself, what kind of start do I want in my race? Because if you haven't figured it out yet, the race is my metaphor for a year in Tosca. So use the race as a metaphor for a year in Toastmasters, and when does the year in Toastmasters start? July 1st. July 1st. Excellent. Excellent. So someone is going to wave that green flag at you July 1st. So my question to you now to ponder, what kind of start are you going to have? Are you going to have the rolling start while you're warming up the tires for a couple of laps? Are you going to have a standing start where you semi-war, but you're starting from a standstill? Or are you doing the Le Mans start when you're standing over there and the race is over there and you're looking for your keys and wondering, well, how am I going to do this? Think about that. How do you want to start the race? All right. Now the race is going on. Things happen during the race. It's not always smooth sailing in the race. All of a sudden, there's a flag man in a corner. They turn four over there. Wave. Thank you. And imagine that you're waving this flag. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. What does this flag mean? Caution. Caution. Excellent. You are a race fan. Excellent. You are a race fan. Yeah, right. it's, it's caution. It could be debris on the track. At this point in time, when you get to a caution, you can have a local caution and turn four over there. Thank you very much. Turn one over there. Thank you. Thank you. And what happens during a caution? Well, you have to slow down. There's danger on the track. Something on the track. There can be debris on the track. And you're not allowed to pass anyone at that point in time. You, with caution, need to pass through that danger zone. And then you're back and up, up racing again, you come back another lap, it's still there. Caution. Okay. I think we know what that means in racing. What does it mean in Toastmasters? This is the point where you should have been warmed up and start shouting things at me. <laughs> I will give you some examples. I will give you some examples. Four minutes to go. Four minutes to go? 
Uh, not quite yet, not a timer here. <laughs> Let, let's say that you're coming out of turn four. <coughs> Go down the straight. There's turn one down there. And then halfway down, there's an oily spot. Hmm? There's oil on the track. So if you don't know that that is going on there, you're going to drive straight through that oily spot. You're going to have oil in your tires, and you know how warm tires are important because you need to grip in the corner, because slick tires will do what? It will put you down in turn one crash, and we have a different flag for that. We'll talk about that later. Right? So you don't really want to drive through that hazard. You have a number of options that you can do here. Because right? you know the option, drive straight through what's going to happen. You're going to go straight into the wall in turn one, and you're going to crash, and you might not finish the race. You can slow down, you can navigate around it, and speed up again, and start, and keep on going. Or, there's the option, you come up to that oily spot, pull the brakes, turn off the engine, get out of the car, start sweeping up that oil spot. When, when that oil spot is clear, well, maybe the race is finished already. <laughs> but you have that option. There's nothing that prevents you from doing it. Hmm? That's three options. And how does that apply to Toastmasters, you ask yourself? All right. Have you uh, ever been on social media? Good. <laughs> have you ever seen internet trolls? <laughs> have you ever seen Facebook Crusaders? Have you ever been in contact with people that never give up? <laughs> they want to give you as a leader all the advice in the world and they will not back down until you do exactly what they tell you. That never happens, does it? Now, so consider that as a metaphor for an early spot. Because what alternatives do you have when that happens to you? Well, you have the alternative to basically ignore it, drive straight through it. What's the troll going to do to you? Put you in the wall. You're going to crash. You're not going to finish the race. The troll wins. Hmm? If you don't take any advice from, from the outside, and just ignore anything, well, that might be powerful people that you're ignoring at that point in time. They will push you out in that point, and you will crash, and you will not finish the race. So really, the alternative number one, drive straight through that oily spot, is not really an option, is it? Right? You can slow down, you can navigate around it a little bit and keep on driving. Right? Have you addressed that oily spot at that point in time? It's still there. Because when you come back on the next lap, it's right there. Shinier than ever, it's right there. There. Thank you. So you can't do that either. Third option. That's what we have left to do now, right? Stop the car, get out, and sweep that large spot of the way. Can you do that? If the metaphor of a Toastmasters here is to erase and finish a race. <coughs> you can't really do that either, can you? There has to be a fourth option. There has to be a fourth option to address that. And there is. The fourth option is, well, you have to rely on others. You have to rely on the track officials to go and help you sweep that up. You have to rely on your spotters that are looking after you and say, there's an orange spot over there, slow it up. You have to rely on the pit crew to give you the instructions on how to manage around that orange spot. And you might have some ideas yourself that you send back to your team and say, well, this is probably how we're going to address it. But I'm driving the car at this point in time. There's only so much I can do. So address the caution that happens during the Toastmasters here. It might be like an oily spot on the racetrack. You cannot do it yourself. Can you? No, I can, in a way, try to say you can. You need more people. The race car driver might be alone in the company, but it relies on the entire team to finish the race. And guess what? We'll get to that too at some point. 
Any more questions about the caution flag? Have you ever been in a situation that where I described that you have an orange spot on the on the racetrack? Yeah. Oh, I think I've heard that before. I'm quite sure I had some as well. Now let's continue the race. Anyone who knows what this flag means? Bad weather? No, this is passing. This is the passing flag. In different uh, racing circuits, it might be a solid blue. This happens to be the Indy series with an orange stripe straight through it. So what does this mean? It can mean two things. It can mean that you are approaching someone who drives slower, and that person needs to get out of the way because you're running a, a faster race. Or it can be actually you that get the blue flag because you're driving so slow that people are coming up behind you and they want to pass you. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, very straightforward in racing. See a blue flag and if they're waving at, the, at you, someone else is coming up faster, you're a hazard, get out of it. Now, can we apply that to Toastman? Oh, yes, maybe we can. Maybe we can. Now, there are many things that can happen in Toastmasters when you have a blue flag, for example. Early on in the year, you have elected club officers. And they're all excited. They start the race. And they keep on going. They keep on going. They ignore the officer's train. <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> never. It's always seven for seven. Always. No, there is someone in the team that might slow down a little. There might be some others in the team that are hungrier and coming up from behind. And they want to take over, or they want to pass. And what if that car is you? If this is you that we're talking about? It's time for a reflection, isn't it? Right? We don't want you to see a blue flag if it's waving at you. Maybe we want to see a blue flag when it's waving to someone else, because that means I'm doing something that is better. It's doing something that is correct. <coughs> Any other examples that you can think of at that point in time? That works. Let's keep on going with the flag. Fantastic. Red flag, what does that mean? Stop. Stop. And typically you get a red flag when there is a significant danger on the race track. Now, different race circuits, if you, if you look at Formula One, I can only think of one reason why they would uh, do a red flag, and I'll get to that. In all other racing series here in the United States, if there is a raindrop coming down on the racetrack, they will stop the race. Uh, Formula One, no, because uh, they have signed an agreement with the uh, television stations that at 1 o'clock central, the race starts. Guess what happens 1 o'clock central? The race starts. If it's monsoon rain, what do they do? They start, because they change the tires to monsoon tires. <laughs> there is such a thing. <laughs> They have good weather tires, bad weather tires, and monsoon tires. Right? So the race stops. Most of the times when you see a red flag, it's an extreme danger on the, on the racetrack. Or actually, it might be a significant accident that happens. So there's a yellow flag as well. But it might be a crash where you have to stop the race. There might be a driver that is an extreme danger or actually just passed away. Death. And we never want to give death in a speech. That's never fun. But I must, at this point in time, this is the emotional part of my uh, speech, because uh, during my year as uh, district governor in 2013-2014, I did get a red flag way back in uh, Actually, it was February 2014, when uh, my uh, second in command, was the Lieutenant Governor of Education and Training, passed away in an uh, the Arctic 
What do you do at that point in time? The race is not important anymore, is it? Nothing is important at that point in time. You have to stop, you have to regroup, and you, and you have to compose yourself and, and modify. And that's what we had to do. We stopped the race, we regrouped, and then we had to uh, do a restart. We get a green flag. Again. And uh, it, it's not a very pleasant thing to happen to Mr. Bob. All right. Back to the race. Pick you up again. Pick you up from the emotions. There are plenty of emotions in the race. There's plenty of emotions in the race. Here's another flag that I want you to reflect on. That can have uh, many different meanings depending on which uh, circuit you're, you're driving. In. So last weekend I had an opportunity after the sales calls on Friday to be a half a mile or less than half a mile south of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There's an indoor go kart race track there. And uh, what did the, um, <coughs> the district director do to me? Challenged me on the race. <laughs> so we drove uh, three races on go kart. In go karting, they also have waved the same flags. And they say, well, if we roll this flag up to, because everyone driving go karts are happy, we roll it up like this and we point it at you. Then we're saying, hey, not you, you better slow down. Let's go. And if I, if I give you that black flag, <laughs> guess what? You're out. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. And in general, that's what the black flag means. Now in Indy 500, this means that maybe you should stop in the pit for consultation. Something is not right. It could be that your car is half broken, your wing is flapping in the back, something is falling off and you are in danger of putting other people in danger. So you need to go back in the pit for consultation. Mm -hmm. Get that black flag. In other, in other series, it means that you're immediately disqualified. You're out of here! Right? We don't want that diet to do. So it can have many meanings, depending on where you go. Right? But let's go back to the consultation. Bring, bring something back into the pit for consultation. And go back to making the, the uh, race, the Toastmasters race. Can that apply? Can you have a black flag situation in Toastmasters? Can you have someone, let's say, let's pick an example that of, of course never happens. And you have an area director that uh, decides that I don't want to do my uh, club visits and I will not uh, send in any reports. That never happens, of course, but uh, in case it does, isn't that time to bring that individual into the pit for a consultation. Because we have all signed up for a role, to do a certain role. So the first step at that point in time might be, we need to talk. We need to make a correction. Because next time I wave that flag at you, it's not going to be that pleasant. Because, guess what? You're going to be disqualified. Now we say, well, we are a volunteer organization. We never fire at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, can't, we never hire a fire, we don't have that power. But as a leadership development organization, that's part of leadership. And yes, we do remove individuals from their positions for various things. So there is something called a black flag situation in those methods as well. Again, this is not a flag that we want to have waved at us. And I would argue that's probably as a leader, not a flag that you're so keen on waving to someone else either. But guess what? It's part of your flag set. You have to use it when necessary. <laughs> but you can't abuse it, of course. This becomes a little bit more tricky. How many flags do we have left? You counted them? Two. We got two more? Okay. Let's do that. What does this flag mean? Final lap. Final lap. Guess what? 
Where were I before? I was at lap, lap 197. 199 is the final lap, right? My story didn't really end at the final lap. Because I need to build it up to the final lap and I need to talk about the flag so we know about it first. But where are you in the organization at this point in time in your race? Not quite at the white flag on. Because on the final lap, what can you do on the final lap? If you are a race car driver, you're out driving and you are at the final lap. The only thing you can do is floor it and go as far as you can. Any strategy up to that, the other 198 laps, whatever you did then, can you change that strategy on the last lap so you finish in a better position? Sure. You can? You only got one lap. It's too late. That's my point. There is no time to change your strategy to get to a better position. Because that's something that you must have done before. So when you see this white flag, there's only one thing you can do. Give it all you got, and we will see where it ends up. Because you cannot change the strategy at the end. You have to live with what you have set yourself up to. So think about that. At some point in time, in whatever we do, there will be a white flag. Since this has a beginning and an end, there will be a green flag, there will be a white flag. And that's the last flag, right? No. no. There's one more. There's one more. Okay, we'll do one more flag. And this means they were finished! Awesome! Yay! What position did we get? One. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Does it matter? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Tough audience. The point I want to make that with this checkered flag is. Really, it's a matter of you finishing the race. Yes, we all want to win the race, but there can only be one. And how many districts do we have? How many clubs do we have? How many divisions? How many areas? There can only be one. Right? So the goal is, of course, always to win, but the ultimate goal is what? Finish the race. Right? Because there are so many things that can go on during the race. You might have a yellow flag situation happening, and that will modify your strategy at that point in time. Because how you started things, modify the strategy. Okay, we never talked about that, did we? So back in the 1860s, in Preussen, there was a field marshal called, uh, was it von Monke, who made the following statement. No plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Right? So what have you done? You have started up here in the beginning. You have your strategy. You know what you're going to do. Can you have the same strategy going through the entire race? No! Because what happens July 1st? The plan gets contact with the enemy. <laughs> And you have to pick your own enemy there and make your own metaphor. I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> Want to go back to the race? Right? Lap 197. We're standing there. Excited. You remember the excitement? You remember who number, car number 21 was? Joseph Hugard. You remember that car number 5 was James Hensplit. You remember that car number 10 was Tony Canal. And you remember that car number 26 was Carlos Munoz. They were racing for it. They were going for the end. And we were cheering. It takes less than a minute for a lap. So we figured, well, if you stand here, take a little sip of beer, <laughs> cheer, 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 waiting, 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 nothing. What happened? And then all of a sudden, we saw a car coming and it had the number one after it and said 98. 98. Who's 98, we said, and we started scrambling in our program because we had never seen car number 98 being in the first position. And after a while, we saw car number 21, we saw car number 5, we saw car number 10, and we saw car number 26, and they were trying to catch up, but 98 was right there. What's going on? And in the end, 
Race to the finish? Are you sure? No, car number 98. Won the race! Yay! Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. What happened? What an excitement that was. Because you always want to see the fastest car win. And we had no clue who 98 was because it was either going to be number 21, number 5, number 10, or number 26. And they were nowhere here. Well, 26 got close. What do you do now? Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Go home. Start watching the news, start reading the newspapers, and then you think, well, really? This was race number 100 in the 500s. And really, this was the race that went to the history books, in my mind, as the most exciting race ever, once you figure out what happened. Right? Because, with 36 laps left, the entire field, everyone, went into the pits and filled up their cars with gasoline as much as they possibly can. An Indy 500 car can drive 32 laps on a full tank. Right? There were 36 laps left. What do they do at the, what, lap 197 at that point in time? I need fuel. Everyone went in for fuel. Except number 98. Number 98 kept on going and going and going and never went in for more fuel and eventually won the race. Interesting. What happened? What happened? What really happened was there were two drivers that were switching the lead in the beginning and Hunter Ray and Tonson Bell. They, they were raced to the same team as two other drivers, Alexander Rossi, car number 98, Carlos Munoz, car number 26, and I haven't memorized uh, the uh, younger Andretti's son, car number, because he wasn't really a contender there. But they all raced for Team Andretti. So two of the top contenders, they crashed into each other in the pits, and they were out of the race. Right? So the two contenders that Team Andretti had left was Alexander Rossi, that by the way, has been trained in Europe on the Formula One circuit. He thinks like a Formula One driver, and anyone who follows Formula One knows that Formula One is all about the team sports, and you follow team orders. The team chief will tell you the strategy, and you will execute, right? Carlos Munoz is North American, and they will stereotype North Americans and say, what will you do a North American race car driver want to do? Floor it. Okay? So if you were a team owner and you have those two individuals in your team, one that is trained to follow the team order and follow the lead of the team, and one that is excellent at flooring, would you give them two different strategies if there are 36 laps left? I would. And that's what they did. Because they were gambling in the team and they said, if there's a yellow, Fine. Everyone is going to go into the pits and they're going to fill up gasoline. There's not going to be an issue. It's a normal race. But if there's not a yellow, the race is going to go on, which means that we need to go in at lap 197 and get more gasoline because we're flooring it. That's when you get most of the gas going through your engine and most of the power. But let's see if we can try a different tactic there. So they had put a different tactic on Alexander Rossi, and that was, you're going to finish this, these 36 laps with one tank of gas. This is how we're going to do it. Remember the two individuals that are not a contender anymore? They were driving as hard as they possibly could. They were two laps behind, but their jobs were to basically have Alexander Rossi behind him in the draft, because that's how you save fuel. So they were pushing him around at that point in time as much as possible. Got a little later in, in the uh, race, they told Alexander Rossi, you know what? Coast in the corners. Tell the race car driver to coast on the most important race of the year. What would the normal race car driver say? Ah, <laughs> you're crazy. But he followed the rules. He followed orders. He had no... He had full faith in that there was something going on here. 
So he coasted. We got into lap 198. And the final lap when the white flag was waved, he went, basically was coasting turn one. We need to go one more lap, right? He got the team order that on the straightaway, coast on the straightaway. When you get to turn three, guess where I'm sitting? Turn three. Floor it. Give it all you've got and never let it go. So that's what he did. Final lap. Turn three. Floor it. And he just went down. Turn four. I, I turn four. Hey. But when he came out of turn four, he ran out of gas. Oh, no. He was coasting across the finish line at 174 miles an hour. Behind him, Carlos Munoz, our number 26, was getting closer and closer because he was driving the fastest car really on the race. And he was five seconds behind. So the tactic worked. Right? Fantastic race. What, what is it that you can get out of that story? But besides, it's not the fastest car that finishes and wins the race, always. There is something more to it. There is a huge strategy portion behind it. And again, we go back to Toastmasters as being a race. Putting a strategy together in the beginning, well, the strategy for Andretti team was probably that Townsend Bell was going to win. He's out of contention. He got a new tactic. He gets something new to do. And he executes. Right? The team executes because we need to change depending on what happens. The environment around us changes during that race. Because when, again, when we get to this point here, white flag, there's not much else we can do. There's not much else we can do. Because anything that we've adjusted up to that point is where we're going to finish. So again, back to you all. How will you finish your race? There are two races here. We're creating a new legacy. We're finishing one. We're in the finish of one race. But we're also in the beginning, starting point. We just had elections. We're in the starting point of a new race. There's a new race soon in a different racetrack. It's called 30 and 103. Ask yourself, what kind of start are you going to have when the new year starts? I've said it before. Are you going to have a standing start? Are you going to have a rolling start? Are you going to have a cold start and a long start? And don't be afraid to modify your tactics as you go through it. There are many things that will happen during the way. You will have many yellow flags and be prepared for them. You cannot avoid them. They will happen. And I'm quite sure that anything that we've talked about here in the metaphor will happen during the year. But the key is, let's finish the race. All of us, let's finish the race. With that, well, thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secret Toastmaster and International Director, Magnus Kansen.
All right, we have a great slate of educational sessions this afternoon. A couple of reminders before you go. Magnus, thank you for, I think, changing not only my view of Toastmasters, but removing what has been a great mystery to me in racing. When I watch race, I watch it in silence. Because as they say, better to be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. And now, I'm anxious to watch with my family and friends and say, oh, that looks like a good flag. <laughs> All right, we've got contestant briefings at 4 o'clock in the boardroom and functionaries in Palo Alto. If you do your, bank, your bingo card, turn it into the registration desk by 4.30. And with that, I think it's on to our educational sessions.